Hey guys, my name is Emma and today I'm going to be sharing with you all the books I read in July. I have seven books to talk about today. I have six new ones and one reread. And I don't think I'm going to go in any particular order. So let's just get started. What's on top of my stack? One of the books that I read in July is The Comet Seekers by Helen Sedgwick. And I am so conflicted about this book. Um, in fact, that's just generally the theme of this month is conflict about books. I don't know how I feel about loads of what I read. I want to recommend this book to everybody. I think it was a really beautiful story. It has two major flaws and I will get to those imminently. Um, so it follows two characters who are in different points of their life and each particular time period is when a comet goes across the sky. So the comet is, the, the different comets are kind of the, the, the particular points in the timeline. It follows a woman called Rosen who is um, an astrophysicist. Comets are one of her passions and it follows her through childhood all the way to adulthood. And it also follows Francois who is not linked with comets in any particular way but whose mother can see ghosts and he may end up with that ability and it's about his relationship with her and her relationship with the ghosts and the ghosts are all people from her f her immediate family it's her kind of generation going back um and they only appear when there is a comet in the sky now i thought this book was beautiful um i thought that the timelines were really interesting i liked both the characters i loved the use of the comets to tie everything together and to give that sense of of otherworldliness to it. I have two really major flaws with it. One is a structural one and one is a particular point on the plot. Neither of which are spoilers so you're good. Problem number one. Speech is on a separate line but there are no punctuation marks to indicate when it's starting or ending. It's not crazy problematic. It doesn't actually like ruin the story and make it harder to understand. You do get it but it just bugged me. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it just got under my skin and I didn't like that fact. The second fact is, so Rosen has this relationship with this man back home in Ireland, which is um, a tense one. He lives on a farm that is the family farm and he feels very tied to it and tied to his tradition. She wants to go off traveling because of her academia and studying the stars and basically it's a whole grounded in reality versus wanting to go off and explore so there's already a lot of tension there but for some unknown reason Helen Sedgwick decided to make these two cousins yes you heard me right cousins blood cousins these two main characters who fall in love and have this very tortured romance where they're all torn already because there's all this conflict about her career and his livelihood and oh what do we do oh no let's add in the fact that they're cousins this is an incest book I don't understand why, why, why are their cousins sleeping with each other? They could have been just, just neighbours. It would have worked absolutely fine as neighbours. And actually I would have preferred it because it meant that I could have recommended a book that didn't contain incest. Because now if I recommend this to anybody, I'm saying, hey, you thought the Lannisters were cool? Check this bad boy out. We've got it 2.0. I just, I just have a lot of emotions around this book and this is why I'm conflicted. So if you can get over the fact that they're cousins and you can get over the speech marks fact, it's a beautiful book, recommend it, it's wonderful, it's lovely, but oh my god, you're blood related, what are you doing? The book that I read in July is Mageborn by Stephen Aaron. Basically there's magic in this world that is frowned upon and culturally is considered very problematic and it's starting to cause tensions between those who can wield magic and those who can't, um, which is not a blood thing, you're just born with it or you're not, but there's no like genetic linking so it can just pop up with anyone. And there's a lot of characters, there's a lot of plot, there's a lot of politics. Uh, generally I really enjoyed it, I thought it was an excellent example of the genre. It's a genre that I don't read a crazy amount in, but when I do, I do like something that's going to really get into the nitty gritty. I thought the world building was excellent, I thought the magic system was excellent, um, there were so many strong female characters in this, like, chicks kick ass in this book. I loved it. I can't even begin, there's like four of them that I absolutely just like queen the whole time. It's part of a trilogy, it's the first one, but it's also 
technically the second block of trilogy within this world. So the book references this war that occurred between the mages who are the uh, magic wielding people in the country and sort of the ordinary folk that happened a decade ago and some of the main characters in it were also in that war. That is actually as far as I'm aware the first trilogy and then this is building on from that looking at the cultural and social tensions that will have arisen from that particular scenario. Uh, you don't have to have read the first trilogy for this to make sense because I haven't and I love this book and I thought it was brilliant it was really enjoyable I am probably gonna go and pick up the first trilogy at some point because I'd be really interested in seeing what Stephen Aaron can do with a bit more of a like out and out war setting rather than this very cold war subterfuge setting people up type thing going on in this particular one it's very complicated uh, if I could gripe about any one particular thing it's that there are just a fraction too many characters and it does make keeping track a little tricky. Another book that I read in July is The Dinner by Herman Koch. So I've actually already talked about this book on my channel before because it is my book for the Netherlands for my book world tour wrap up which was published uh, last week, hopefully. Fingers crossed that's all gone out. Um, so this tells the story of two families who the uh, husbands of the families are related, they are brothers and basically their sons, their teenage sons have done something criminal, morally reprehensible and they are meeting to discuss what they should do about this. Um, it's a whole host of unlikable characters, they meet over a very swanky dinner, at least half the book is just the mat dinner like ordering food and the interactions with the waiters and very like nice pleasantries and all this kind of thing. Um, it's one of these books that, again, it, it kind of causes a lot of conflict in me. It's not a nice book. None of the characters are nice. There's no nice resolution at the end. Like, the good guys don't win. There isn't really a good guy in it. They're all very, like, disgusting, creepy people. And it just makes you go, ugh, humanity. But that was one of the reasons why I loved it. It was a bit like a car wreck. Like you just can't help but look and you don't want to and you know you shouldn't. But oh my god, you know you're looking. Uh, from Goodreads reviews, this is the kind of book that you either love or you hate. And I would not be surprised if there are many readers out there who hate it. So I think I said in my book world tour wrap up that if after 50 pages you're still not kind of getting this, abandon it because it doesn't change in style. Like that's, that's just the book, okay? That's just how it works. I personally adored it and could have done with a couple more chapters because I thought all of these characters were just so deliciously disgusting and it was so much fun. Another book I read was by Stephen King uh, but under his pseudonym Richard Backman which was The Running Man. Uh, this is the third Stephen King that I've read and the first one that I can say oh, hand over my heart I've actually enjoyed. Uh, I've got a bit of a tense relationship with King in the book world. Uh, I personally think the man can't end a book to save his life. Uh, I've read Lizzie's story, generally thought it was okay but very long-winded, and I've read Revival, which the first three quarters of it, oh, fantastic book. The final chapters, oh my god, what the hell were you thinking? As Backman, we like King. So this was written in the 80s, but it follows a reality TV show style that is very reminiscent of The Hunger Games, uh, 1984, um, that episode of Doctor Who where they spoofed all of the light reality TV shows of the time but made it so that you died at the end. Does anybody remember that? They had the android. It was freaking wicked. We love that one. Um, but basically this is like the precursor to all of that. It's so, well, not 1984. 1984 was written a very long time ago. But you know what I mean. It's, it's the precursor to lots of those things. Um, essentially it's in a dystopian world where shit's gone wrong. Um, there are polluted slums and then the kind of rich upper echelon as such and you can make money by entering game shows where you will end up suffering in some way but then your payoff will be bigger because of it. So it follows the main character Benjamin Richards who uh, has a very ill daughter and he is desperately trying to raise money to be able to pay for her hospital bills. So what he does is he puts himself forward to the big TV show uh, hosts as such who are very much government run uh, to be entered in one of their many TV shows. Now you don't apply to a particular TV show, you go and do a series of tests and then you get to assign to one depending on what kind of health status you have. Now he hits the jackpot because jackpot? 
he hits the jackpot because he gets assigned to The Running Man, one of the biggest and most infamous of the game shows of all, where the jackpot can be up to, I think it's a billion dollars? Yeah, billion dollars. So it's nice and simple, you get a 24 hour head start and then they come after you and when they find you, they kill you. Easy. The game ends when you get caught and you are dead. And basically every hour that he can stay um, outside of the 24 hour head start, every hour that he can stay um, undiscovered is another load of money for his family and it just keeps going on and on and on. I mean with a, with a book premise like that you kind of know where the ending's going because there is really only one way that we can finish this, the bloke's gonna die. Like spoiler alert, he ends up dying. I won't say how, I think King did a really interesting thing with it at the end so I'm very impressed with what he was doing there but he does die because of course he's going to, there's no way that this book can end any other way. I thought it was awesome fun, it's really thin, I blitzed it in one session. I this has actually managed to change my mind about King and means that I'm far more likely to read some of his books in the future. And I think if you're a fan of any of that Hunger Games, Divergent, um, God, there's so many, the Maze Runner, like, so many dystopian books out there these days, but this is one of the originals, which is so cool. I will say it's a product of its time. He wrote it in the 80s. There are a few slurs with more than slightly racist undertones and some very sexist comments. You just kind of have to take it with a pinch of salt because it's it's written in the 80s and it's it's just, it's a different time. It's 40 years ago now. You just it sucks, but you just have to roll with that. Um, so yeah, totally recommend it. Wicked. Cover's very cool as well. I like this. The last new book that I read in the month of July is Testosterone Rex by Cordelia Fine. Now this is a non-fiction book. It's the only non-fiction book that I read this month. And this is looking at the main scientific reasoning behind a lot of the differences between, or perceived differences between men and women being linked to testosterone or hormones in general and basically is a debunking of a lot of the um, widely accepted kind of common knowledge ideas about testosterone and its role within the body specifically looking at its role within men versus women. Um, she has written a couple of other books before looking at the scientific distinctions between men and women and also more more closely the general public's conception of the scientific differences between between men and women, specifically looking at the, the naturalistic determinism that seems to have sprung up within science in the kind of past sort of 30 years or so, maybe even a bit more now, um, where the differences between men and women within society end up getting blamed on various biological and scientific reasons rather than being cultural constructs. Delia Fine's first book is called Delusions of Gender and I think that it's a much stronger place to start than this particular one. I read it for university, it was published a few years ago. This feels like an update on this with a particular slant on testosterone, clearly, hence the name. Uh, it was interesting. I think her other book is more powerful. So I, but equally, I think that this isn't necessary to read if you've read her other book. So if you've never read any of her other books before, I would start with Delusions of Gender because it's a much broader sweeping look. And if you have read Delusions of Gender, I probably wouldn't bother reading this because it feels a bit like a rehash. So I don't actually know what the purpose, what purpose this book is serving because I feel like everything that she's trying to do in here, she does better in Delusions of Gender. If you're super into science and really, really keen on that as well as feminist rhetoric, then I would read this because it's chock full of all sorts of scientific studies. It's got tons of references at the back. It's a really good jumping off point if you wanna go into a kind of further exploration of this. If you're just looking for a lighter read of pop science plus feminism, get Delusions of Gender, it's much more powerful. The final book that I read in the month of July was a reread and it was one of my absolute favourites which is The Gargoyle by Andrew Davison. Hmm. This book um, follows an unnamed narrator who at the very beginning suffers um, very severe burns across his body due to a car accident. It covers his recovery in the burns unit and because of that his change in lifestyle. So pre-burn he was a porn star, a drug addict, a generally not very nice human being and then post burns he can't do any of that anymore um, that world is really close to him and so it's about his rediscovery of what it means to be alive now with that 
he is helped by a woman called Marianne who has according to our society some very severe mental health issues according to her she is actually from the 1300s and she is a nun in that time and that they have met before and fallen in love before in that time and it's about their love transcending through time and his recovery through her i personally find this to be a really beautiful book she tells lots of little stories throughout it about love in various different forms which are just so touching and moving i found the amount of research that the author went into about burns and how you recover from them and how you treat them to be incredible and really engrossing i loved the way it all tied in together i loved all the characters oh there's one more so i don't have it with me because it was a uh, library book but i also read the book sand by hugh howey and now hugh howey has written a trilogy which is called the silo trilogy i think and it is wool shift and dust and basically those ones are set in an underground bunker it's all dystopian it's very exciting and you get to find out lots of stuff sand is his latest in the new trilogy um which is again dystopian world and this time the whole world is just a desert and we don't know why but water is very scarce there's lots of sand everywhere everything's a bit difficult and honestly i really wouldn't bother with it um i'd probably only give it kind of two 2.5 out of 5 stars it's perfectly adequate as a book if you've not read any of his other stuff and you've not read much dystopian fiction you might enjoy it there's a lot of information about um the way that sand works in this world and how they have adapted to there being literally like constant sand everywhere but also constant wind so it's constant moving sand everywhere moving sand um Personally for me, it didn't have enough of any of the elements that I enjoy in a dystopian fiction. There was too much world building in terms of like tiny little details that I didn't really care about. There are about 30 different words for different kinds of sand, depending on what that sand is doing to you. So if it's the sand caught in your collar, it has a different word to the sand that ends up in your like eyelashes, to the sand that ends up in your shoes, to the sand that ends up, and it just, just, it's sand guys, stop it. But it also didn't include enough world building about the things that I cared about, which was like, how did this happen and why did this happen? And they have these like awesome dive suits, which mean that they can like go underneath the sand quite far with like oxygen tanks as if they're, they're like proper scuba divers. But they use something special with it to make the sand be able to flow and move around them so they don't get buried. And I wanted to know more about that. Like I wanted to know how that worked. And it just feels like Hugh Harry kind of off the back of the success of Silo, which he's done, it's a really solid trilogy and i definitely recommend that one it feels like he's kind of scrabbling around looking for his next big dystopian series and just kind of gone oh sand that looks like fun and i really didn't rate it at all so wouldn't bother with that one go read wool instead far more interesting okay now that is actually it so i'll see you in my next video and just have a really good week okay bye